All right, good evening, everybody. It is our pleasure to be meeting with Tim Hill, who has an eponymous, I like that word. Um, that's a gallery named after himself, um, gallery in Michigan, outside Detroit. And where were you raised? Actually, I grew up in uh, Minneapolis, but it, it's not just myself. The gallery's run by my wife and I, Pam, Pam Hill. Why don't we bring her on? Pam and I founded the gallery together. Why doesn't, doesn't, why doesn't Pam come sit next to you and we'll... we'll, we'll... Uh, yeah, you know, that's a great idea. You know, I find her in a few minutes. But yeah, that's great. Uh, Minneapolis is where I grew up. So, Tim, all right. So, all right. Um, 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 where'd you go to high school? Where'd you go to college? Uh, I ended up graduating from... Here's, here's Pam. Hi, Pam. Uh, Hi. I went to high school in Minneapolis and then uh, graduated from Michigan State. When did the uh, two of you meet? Actually, at college. When did you, who, who came up with this harebrained idea of let's start an art gallery? You could have had a circus. <laughs> we started out as teachers. You I go, was teaching you, art. Tim was teaching history. And uh, what, we, wait a minute, what uh, level? Uh, high school uh, history? I'm sorry? Were you teaching high school history? I was. Yeah. I did that. I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know we had that in common. Yeah, it was, uh, it was terrific. I enjoyed it. Uh, and, and, all right, and what, Pam, what were you doing? I was teaching uh, art. All right, Tim, did you, th did you have an art degree? Did you think you wanted to be an artist, or are you just like the, the pretty girls no, who were in the no, art department? I didn't have an art degree. I never thought about being uh, an art dealer, really, or uh, so certainly not. It was just about Pam and aesthetics. No, yeah. it isn't just about me. Yeah. Uh, Tim's very, uh, uh, always had a great understanding of art. When but, did you guys decide to open an art gallery? Well, the way we got into it is a very interesting story. Because serendipity plays a big role in our whole life. And uh, Tim and I, like a lot of young married teachers, didn't have much money, so we would go uh, to uh, antique auctions to find works for our house, you know, furniture and a few pieces of art. And one day we drove by a uh, antique shop that was for sale and uh, at night and we looked and we said, hey, let's just for fun, let's call and find out what this guy is asking for his shop. And so Tim called him. Tim is definitely the uh, uh, leader of a lot, including getting out there early. So anyway, Tim calls the guy and finds out the guy wants a very small amount of money for the contents of his antique shop. So we say, huh, wouldn't that be fun? Mm -hmm. So we bought it, not knowing much at all about antiques. What, year, what century? What year was this? We had two great advantages, you know, we had no money and no knowledge. So those that two works really well. Yeah, you can't lose that much, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> and we bought, we bought the place, got rid of most of the junk, and started deciding what we wanted to do with it. And gradually, uh, over a period of a few years, it started to take on the character of what we found within the context of American antiques. And that is American folk art. And American folk art was always under the umbrella of the antique world. So we would seek out the uh, work of the self-taught and uh, start to celebrate that within the overarching idea of antique shop. So that took us into a wide range of possibilities, doing shows nationally, getting involved in a whole network of people who were uh, involved in this part of self-taught. What, what year are we talking about? Are we talking about the early 70s? Late yeah, 70s? it was. Mm -hmm. Back well, in our, in our community, in this area, you know, you had... Um, Wait, like where is that? Birmingham, Michigan area, Detroit. You had people like Bob Bishop who went on to be the director of the Museum of American Folk Art. He had a bunch of collectors. He had a number of artists, contemporary artists, who were also collecting in this field. So one thing just led to another, and pretty soon we're, we're thinking about the ideas of exhibiting and representing contemporary artists. So by 1980, we actually opened a contemporary gallery in downtown Birmingham. And we, we had this idea that a lot of contemporary collectors were 
were involved in tribal art as a adjunct collecting possibility that came out of the formal traditions of uh, cubism and all of the work that they were thinking about. And we thought, what if we introduce these same contemporary collectors to American folk art as an alternative to the tribal art collecting? So on one hand, we were showing contemporary work. On the other hand, we were showing folk art. And it worked pretty well. Um, we were able to build a number of very interesting collections in our area as well as do things nationally. So, it, you know, by 19... 82, you could walk into the gallery and you'd see a, a Mark de Subaru sculpture, you'd see a, a African mask, you'd see a piece of Native American art, a Bill Trailer drawing. Uh, it had this range of possibilities, but every one of them had certain informative connections to the other. It wasn't necessarily what they looked like. It's what the idea was going on in the art. And, you know, we kept working with the same, same set of principles, and we still do. Um, I think we do probably much more in the contemporary field now than we, we did before. Uh, those are much more active representing people and promoting their careers, both as sculptors and painters and photographers than we were maybe in American folk art, but we still are involved in that field. Why the transition? Or did it just happen and it's an observation and it's more fun to live with somebody that, I, mean, I think that's a difference between working with, as I used to define it, vertical artists and horizontal artists, um, horizontal being the dead ones. Um, and you know, the relationship, et cetera. Do you, do you have a preference? You mean between uh, contemporary artists and, and, and states and or bodies of, you know, or. Poker. Poker. Yeah. Well, folk art doesn't have to be a deceased artist to be folk no, art, no, does it? No, uh, no I, I think it, it doesn't so much have to do with the category as it has to do with the, the material itself, the art. And if the art speaks to us and it comes out of, out of that arena of American folk art, fine. And if it comes out of the arena of the fine art field academically, that's fine as well. We were probably one of the few galleries uh, in the very, very early period that was willing to understand, integrate these things together, um, you know, and give them an equal dialogue. Yeah, I think you're right. The qualities that Tim and I were looking for in American folk art, the uh, personal expression, the exploration of material, the kind of unique personal interpretation of whatever the idea was, was basically the same uh, kind of metaphor that we used in looking at art and fine art. So for us, I mean, there's a difference in the circumstances of folk art and artists and contemporary artists, but the material for us had the same uh, excitement. If it, you know, we had purity and expression and exploration. So for us, even though the circumstances of the two worlds were different, the aesthetic experience was pretty much the same. So we also originally thought that people that were collecting folk art would uh, automatically like relate to contemporary art or vice versa. But the truth was in those days that those were two fields that were quite separate. But now, um, you know, our sort of art cultures evolved to a point where people are looking at um, art and the qualities that make up for expression across the board, whether it's folk art or contemporary art. And especially now, more than ever, like outsider art has influenced Contemporary art. You see a lot of work right now. It's hard to tell if it is outsider art or if it's just really expressive contemporary art. No, I think that's a really good point. When you're dealing with outsider art, is it are you having relationships with artists or is it mostly relation? It is. You do. Oh, or sure. Not yeah. solely relationships with pieces. Well, it's, both. It's, yeah, both, actually. 
Okay. Yeah. But when you're representing, when you're working with contemporary artists, it's mostly well, it's the same thing, but it's different. I mean, it's relationship. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Both aspects, the art and the artist. If we are. Lucky. How many artists do you work with? Probably uh, about a dozen, I guess. Maybe, maybe about 15. Contemporary. How many, how many fall into each category? Say that again. About 15. 15. Contemporary artists. Contemporary. But, and how many, how many um, uh, folk artists? Well, a lot of the folk art that Tim and I are involved with really is, uh, some of it we know who the artist is, but a lot of times they're anonymous. Uh, so a lot of folk art, we really don't know the artist at all. So we determine right. a lot about that artist through the art, you know, understanding the circumstances by style and, you know. Is that a Thornton region. dial behind you? Pardon? Is that Thornton dial behind you? No, no this is actually uh, John Walker, who is a really excellent contemporary <laughs> art. I know, that's what made me laugh. Tim <laughs> caught me. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and whose is the piece folk on the art. Yes, the figure is folk art. And who's that? Do we know who that is? We don't know. No, we don't. We know that uh, the artists made four of them. They were made as lamps for. Uh, Do we consider artists. Thornton Dial? We consider Thornton Dial a folk artist. Yeah, yeah. Thornton Dial is considered, you know, self-taught. Self -taught. We consider Thornton Dial a contemporary artist. Uh, I th yeah, I think I think in many ways, sir, he's working current. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, and he works with a. Um, Wide range of medium and material. Yeah, exactly. How? But he's not all that old, is he? Thornton. Like, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, how? How many, How often are you guys looking for artists or f seeing somebody, and then wanting to pursue the art and or relationship? And how often? How do your relationships happen with these with the artists? I'm going to back up further. You guys are like passionate about the artists with whom you have relationships. How do these things grow? How do these relationships occur that you fall in love? What, what happens from, you know, love at first sight, if that is what it is, to a, a commitment to the artist? Yeah, well, I think, I think it depends on, uh, on the material, you know, on the art. Here's a perfect example. Uh, two years ago, we were thinking about photography that was done in the Detroit area. And we became involved with an artist named Bill Rawhauser. Now, Bill is 95. So uh, we started looking at his work and realized it was uh, extraordinary. For 30 years, he taught photography at the Center for Creative Studies. And he also was walking around the streets of downtown Detroit, taking these rather remarkable photographs. So he put together a, a couple of books. He was involved in the photography world. He opened a small gallery in the 60s uh, in Detroit area, but nothing much had really happened. And we found out about this artist and uh, his material and started, started talking to him and looking at it and realized this would be just a great relationship. These were exactly the photographs we were thinking about. Images of, a city and its inhabitants locked in a certain time capsule from 1950 to 1960. They were done in black and white. They were highly formalistic. They were very insightful. They were done with a, a great deal of purpose and intention. So that relationship started out and is still ongoing. And recently, you know, he just received the Kresge Eminent Artist Award at 95. He's out shooting photographs now. Um, you know, he comes to the gallery and talks to us on a regular basis. We're involved in all different projects with him, uh, getting ready to produce his show upcoming. But I think what really happened is we sat down and we, we asked him, what, what, what sort of didn't happen to you in your art career? What is it that you sort of wanted to do and it didn't work out or you weren't able to do that? And what we gleaned from all of that is, number one, scale he wanted to make these images in a much larger scale and he, he wasn't in the technically capable of doing that uh in his dark room so we figured out how to make all of that work for him and we produced this show of large-scale images 
and um, he got very excited, and it was a it was a great celebration. And so we're ongoing with him right now. We're doing quite a lot, and it's a uh, it's a very back and forth dialogue. Um, it's a nice process, and it's kind of a unique uh, situation for us where we have be, become so involved actually in the uh, kind of the aesthetic process of uh, his work in the sense that we took his work that really was very small, dark room, you know, eight by 10 images. And we, along with him, uh, made these very large. And so with photography, you know, if a large image is more, um, it speaks to a person, people are really get into the images. And so in that sense, we've had a really big effect on uh, Bill's career. Uh, he's a genius though. I mean, his genius is that he manages as a street photographer to capture a moment that is personal and of the moment and yet has a kind of uh, timeless quality. So people are really freaking out over the wonderful intensity of his work. And this has been very exciting for us. What, what, what matters in evaluating, considering a relationship with an artist? I mean, does geography, where they live, matter? Does their age, does their gender, does their media? Does any of that, do you guys have to agree? Do you take turns? Does it, like, darling, we don't have any artists anymore. We need an artist. <laughs> I'm tired of these 17 Art. people. We need Art. 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 Yeah. What, what, what? Drives a, the art drives the process, and you know, if they, you know, it isn't so much about the region, uh, age, and none of that. So it, could, it comes from the art first, and then we just figure out how to put the rest of it together if we're that excited. And uh, if we, you know, it's, it's a great deal of work to um, deal with and promote and celebrate these things. So uh, it takes a lot of time. And... It, it, they're, they're really, many times, you just don't have time to be thinking about adding more onto the play. You know, if you're really going to represent somebody, our history has been, we dig in very deeply and we spend a lot of time working on it. And we think about all aspects of that artist's career and how to do the best possible way, of, the best possible presentation for them. You know, in terms of collectors, museums, getting it out into the larger world. So uh, I, I wrote a book that's coming out in a few months, and I, one of the things I clarify is the definition of a gallerist and a dealer, you guys. And we're talking to a couple of gallerists here, as Tim just elucidated about, you know, caring about, caring about an artist's career first and foremost, foremost, and what's good for the work and where it goes, and that's a gallerist. A dealer is the person who bluntly is uh, interested in consummating the deal, um, you know, selling that painting, making the buck, moving on to the next piece. That is not a bad thing, but I think people who are gallerists would prefer not to be dealers. Though a lot of times people talk about their dealers meaning they're gallerists as well. Um, you know, the gallerist is still a newer, a newer kind of term. Yeah, yeah. I, I never related very well to that term. But basically, we, we connect with the art, and the artist makes the art. So when we, first we see the art, then we usually, that it goes, then we meet the artist. And the bond that we have with artists, and we have very strong relationships with our artists, but they're based upon our great uh, affection for what they make, and their, uh, you know, appreciation of our response. So we have a, a, an immediate bond because we're, we're connecting there. And that's kind of the, the basis of it. Uh, we, Tim and I, are teachers, <laughs> but we don't like present the gallery as like, uh, okay, this is our classroom. But we are very much about showing art and uh, exposing people to the experience of looking at art and not about buying and selling. I mean, the selling and acquiring is something we certainly appreciate and want our clients to do, but that is not what we're about. We're really about showing the work and helping people understand what they're looking at. So, all right, so what do you think about art fairs? 
and unfortunately, what do you think about the, the, the relative demise or shrinkage of brick and mortar galleries in favor of virtual galleries? I mean, it's hard to have the same kind of relationship with a computer screen. Totally. Well, it's, it's something, we something we talk about all the time. Uh, the art fairs are... <laughs> this is the exception. Yeah. The art fairs are, um, are a difficult thing in many ways. You know, it's a love-hate relationship. Um, on one hand, you know, you, you, you're involved with those things to, ex to celebrate the work and engage people in maybe looking at something they hadn't thought about before and present it in a way that um, makes that possible. On, on the other hand, many of these things are turning into uh, these large commercial events that make it very difficult to achieve the goal you set up in the first place. So um, that's become um, a two-edged sword. Uh, as far as the gallery goes, you know, we're able to present some uh, rather extraordinary exhibitions, and we have one up right now that's taken us about a month to put together. Uh, of Tadaki Kuyama, uh, this, this amazing painter um, whose career has um, now just started to become seriously celebrated around the world. He came to, from Japan to America in 1958 with his wife, also an artist, and uh, immediately connected with the Green Gallery and Dick Bellamy and had a very interesting start. But, um, did many of the things afterward in Japan and Europe, and it's just now American collectors are starting to really look at this work. Uh, you guys have had a role in that, haven't you? Yeah, I think so. Uh, we've been very active in the last two years, doing these works at art fairs, putting them up next to paintings that share a sensibility or a relationship. I mean, most of the the Installations that we do at an art fair are uh, curated to the point where there's a, a built-in point of view and a dialogue ongoing. It's not simply a stage for resale for us. Even though, you know, in the number of years we've been involved, we get a great deal of art offered back to us. They were originally sold. So there are these possibilities. But when, when that comes into play, we're trying to integrate it into a exhibition that um, has the possibility of the overall thing being transformative. Uh, so I'm not sure that answered the thing about the affairs, but you know, we, we certainly are engaged in that process. I mean, we do the Chicago just recently, in fact, that's where I was talking to you, at Expo Chicago and uh, Armory Modern Fair, and we've done a number of folk art uh, fairs as well, including the outside affair last year. So I think it's, it's now we see it as a, a curatorial possibility. And we're, we're concentrating on um, in-depth presentations of, of a number of artists. It and sounds like, you know, there, 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 there are a number of artists and curators and collectors that we've spoken to I mean, who you sound a little bit like is we don't worry about the money. We follow the passion and the integrity and the money takes care of itself. Pretty much, okay. <laughs> it does. I mean, uh, it has, you know, this is our 35th year, I think, with our name on a door in Birmingham. So it's worked out pretty well. Where do you make your money? Or do you not even know where you make your money? It's we don't know where we make our money. We have no clue. <laughs> we just hope that well, it comes and yeah. it does. You know, <laughs> you, know well, you guys, we did a, we did a wonderful, I don't, I don't know, do you know Foster Goldstrom? Name is familiar, but I, I don't know. Foster's been in the art world since the early 70s in the San Francisco Bay Area and owns an amazing home. And he talks about not worrying about money. If he needs a dollar, or if he needs a million dollars, it'll show up. Yeah. And um, he has just such an awesome, and you guys have, you know, your attitude seems more realistic. Um, but it's really, 
it, it, it's not necessarily or particularly American to go, I don't make a priority of the money, I make a priority of the genuineness of the experience, of the integrity of the artwork, of the oneness of my relationship with the object. You know, that doesn't sound American. <laughs> well, we well, couldn't show the really powerful pieces that we show uh, if we were worried about the money, because a lot of the pieces we know are pushing the economic envelope. They're very, very expensive pieces, but they are very powerful pieces, and they're among the very best pieces that the artists that we uh, represent make. So we say, well, okay, we probably won't sell this, but it is a magnificent piece, and we want it to be seen. If we were worried about making money, then maybe we would say, oh, well, let's take the, the small pieces, the pieces that maybe are more affordable to the people. But that isn't what we're doing. We're trying to show the best. And uh, the best can be, you know, difficult to acquire. But that's a very big part. We want the best to be seen. Who's in charge? <laughs> Oh. We both are. <laughs> I, 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 it's, David it's, Allen, it's, I want to come to and answer your question. You wrote in some good questions. And do you want to, do you go by David or do you go by David Allen? You're unmuted. Who are we talking to? Here I am, David. Okay, yeah. David. Um, 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 all right, ask your first question. Well, now I have to look at it, Paul. Um, Actually, one question was, my wife, who is a very experienced business person, is beginning to help me with my, um, with my work and with marketing my work. And I'm wondering a couple of things. One is, as a couple who've been working together for many years, do you have any advice for a couple who are working together in the same enterprise? And the second is, as gallerists, um, how do you feel about having an artist approach you through a partner, whether it's a spouse or whether it's some other person who's helping them with their the business aspects of their practice? Uh, I don't think it matters to us uh, about the approach. I think we're just thinking about the art, however it comes in, um, you know, then we're interested and then we'll figure the rest of it out later. But uh, I'm, there, there are all different ways that people have of presenting their work and figuring out how to get it out into the world. You know, for us, we just, uh, we're interested in looking at it. And then after that, I don't know, we don't make a lot of judgments about that part of it. So if you two are working this out and, and she's up, it's great. And if it gets your work out to be seen, that's terrific. You know? Great. Any, any advice for working together as a couple who have to live together? He's talking to David or? No, to you. I said, any advice to a couple who are working together who, who also have to live together as spouses? Don't hold grudges. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. <laughs> no, we battle uh, all the time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you just don't uh, hang on to the battles. Great. Thank you so much for spending time with us. David, there's, there's two webinars that we've done on this subject that are a little different than, I mean, there's a difference in emphasis here because um, they're both dealing with a similar or interlocking expertise where what you're talking about is someone who has complementary expertise, you know, so that I've, I've done two webinars um, on the subject of artists having a business manager. And one is with Stan Klein, and Stan is not related to me, but is a wonderful man who was and maybe still is Tony Fitzpatrick's business partner and, you know, challenged Tony as an artist to do certain things that he wouldn't have done otherwise, and that's what the webinar is spent discussing. Mm -hmm. um, and Robbie Klein, who is one of my ex-wives, um, we did a webinar with, she's a friend, um, I'm on my third marriage and it took me three times to get it right. Um, but Robbie, Robbie doesn't currently, but did work as an artist business manager in, in a lot of the capacity that Stan Klein talked about. 
um, and has a lot of good information there. Um, and you know, you can you, you can extrapolate from that to what you know maybe you are already doing and get patted on the back and learn some new pointers. The idea of any of you guys, an artist, having a, a business partner is different than a studio assistant, it is different than an intern, it is different than an apprentice, and I think an apprentice is an idea that should be making a comeback, um, but it's different than that. And listening to these two webinars about an artist business partner, I think, is a, is a good thing. Um, you also had a question, David, about folk and fine art. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, my, my question was that there, there's the, the categories of fine art and folk art and the notion of someone being an outside artist. Um, I'm actually trained as an architect, and I've come to art late in my life. But I'm wondering if you have any advice for, well, one is, do you really see a distinction there between uh, an, an outside artist who's doing fine art and a folk artist? And two, do you have any advice for someone who is somewhat of an outsider to the art world, though I, though I have training in the fine arts, um, coming into the art world? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just pop in my opinion, and Tim can say what he has to say also. But basically, to us, uh, your uh, artist circumstances in life, whether it's an architect who turns into an artist or an outsider, a uh, person who's in a mental hospital who makes art or whatever the circumstances are that, uh, that, uh, of an artist, what really is, that's biographical as far as we're concerned. Uh, what we're interested in is the, you know, purity and innovation and uh, individualism in the art. And as far as the circumstances of the art, that's just relative to who it is. So as far as categorically uh, putting people into, you know, slots, it's true that some people are actually societal outsiders. So they fit into the outsider category very easily. And then there are people who are self-taught, who are genius, and uh, they might just be a contemporary artist, or they might be somebody who has no training at all, but ha happens to make fabulous work. So, you know, it's relative. It's really relative to us. So it's not a, it's, it's a, just a definition and on the bio, basically, of the circumstances of one's life. Hmm. Also, uh, I think, you know, decoding the art in terms of understanding what it is, what it looks like, where it comes from, there are some very significant differences at play into this. And, uh, you know, the academic community presents all kinds of strategies and understandings of art and art history that become uh, recognizable and visually uh, connected. But I think, um, you know, for us, it's, we're, we're looking for the authentic channel that is the most direct to the, the, the real source that's driving the idea. And um, I'm not, I'm not that interested in how one gets that to that place. Uh, even though I think by looking at a great deal of material, we can, we can you know, pretty readily decode how it got there um, and what might have influenced it. But listening to that process from the artist is always uh, an exciting proposition if we're interested to start with. Becky has a question. If other people have questions, it would be very cool if you raised your hand. Um, Becky, go ahead. Well, I'm going to probably reveal my naivete or the fact that I'm an emergent artist when I Good ask for you. this. <laughs> but, Better um, you I than was, me. <laughs> <laughs> I was really struck. I guess I had not ever thought about a gallery using art fairs. I understand a gallerist going to an art fair to scope out potential artists. I understand that. And I understand artists that might choose to have uh, participate in an art fair. But I haven't thought about galleries actually having exhibits at art fairs. And so I would like to hear a little bit more about where that fits into a gallery's um, mission and business plan and how might the 
art fair presence of an artist be different with a gallery as compared to entering that art fair um, yourself as an artist and setting up an exhibit? In the world of art, where there are those who think they are fine, emphasis, fine art galleries and self-anointed and self-impressed, there are corresponding art fairs that cater to those self-impressed people and charge them in the neighborhood of forty dollars to $150,000 to exhibit their wares for four days amongst others who are similarly impressed usually showing objects in excess of $10,000, frequently up to $10 million. But most of it in the $10,000 to $250,000 range. There are a lot of fairs like that. Collectors like going to those because there are other collectors there and they can be ostentatious about their purchases. This could be construed as the shallowizing of the fine art world, except that the auction houses are already leading the way. Um, and, it, you know, as we've talked about, there are lots of different art villages, and there are lots of different strata within those art villages. And we're talking, you know, about, you know, finding the village that you want to be in, and then figuring out how to get there is what this course is. Um, there are artists in this class who definitely want to be exhibiting in art fairs. There are artists in this class who feel like art fairs are not appropriate for them. Art fairs have been proliferating for perhaps 20 years when I say art fairs. I mean these art fairs that charge 20 to $40 as admission entrance for in single individuals. Um, as opposed to street fairs, you know, which are another viable village that are like five or six dollars, and there are other kinds of entities. Um, so they've been prolifer proliferating, and art galleries have had to contend with. I could go to these damn things every every other weekend in you know and travel the world, going from Germany to Switzerland to France to London to New York to Miami to Chicago to Houston to Los Angeles to San Francisco to Tokyo to Hong Kong, and keep on going, okay, and then keep on going around again. There are art fairs all the time, or I have to, I should stay home and defend my turf. Um, you know, and I think most galleries do what the Hills have done, Tim, correct me, but, you know, pick and choose a few, but they've chosen to not solely focus on the commercial aspect of the art fairs, which tend to be whorehouses and or commerce, fairs, fair, fair, it's a fair, you know, it's not a museum exhibit, it's a fair. But it sounds like the Hills are trying to do curatorial kinds of things within that context, you know, and perhaps I think pragmatically, you know, draw attention to themselves and distinguish themselves and the integrity of their agenda um, and, and distinguish themselves while not putting so much pressure on themselves to, just to make money at that intersection at that moment. Okay. Whew, that was a long one. Um, Tim, Tim, Pam, you want to comment? Well, you know, the region that we're operating in is, uh, has, a, has a limited possibility for people to come and see what's going on. So a lot of what we think about in terms of art fairs, how do we get the program that we're involved in out into a very large participatory audience? So if we're uh, working on an idea that uh, is part of an exhibition. Let's just take that idea and enlarge it to an audience that could include 50,000 people. So the fairs, the ones that we're targeting, uh, are bringing that kind of audience to what we're thinking about. And we can engage them there. So it's, we just take our gallery and move it to the fair. Uh, you know, with some editing, depending on the time of year, what, was, you know, what that fair is all about. Um, so in many, that, that's what we're up to with, with the fairs. Um, but I think, uh, it's a very, it's, it's, the fairs are a slippery slope, you know, they're, they're on one hand, they're loaded with all kinds of art and some of it's rather extraordinary. On the other hand, there's a shopping mall sort of idea going on. And so somehow you try to find a balance that allows you to, uh, keep the integrity of the art intact 
integrate with the possibility of collectors and, and artists and somehow make it uh, work in a way that is not quite as crass and commercial as the uh, little dialogue you just laid out. That doesn't always work, but uh, that's the intention. Um, Kathleen asked a question about um, street fairs and things like that. You know, and I knew an artist who in the late 80s, John Frazier, who showed with, who later showed with Roy Boyd, who was making um, $250,000 a year in the mid to late 80s showing in street fairs and decided that what he really wanted was a master's degree in fine art. So he went and he dropped out from making art in street fairs at a quarter of a million bucks a year in his pocket and went and got his master's degree and he did really, really, really well and was making $80,000 a year. That's really good for somebody with a master's in the art world. $80,000 a year in the late 80s, you know, selling his art. And now he's got like six or seven galleries. But, you know, this is an interesting conscious choice that, you know, you are, in, as an artist, you are entitled to make. And, you know, feel proud about whatever, either direction you want to go in. Or, you know, myriad other ones, um, like commissions or grants or, um, I don't know, they're a whole mess, public art, but that's like commissions. Um, um, I'd right. like to add one thing about the uh, street fairs, and that is that, you know, in the hierarchy of uh, artists who are beginning to show their works that do not have local representation, and it is very difficult for artists to get local representation. So art fairs, and most communities have them, and they are uh, somewhat, you know, they're selected. You have to... Uh, submit your work to become accepted in a particular, any art fair for that matter. So it's a really great way for artists to start to expose their work to the audience and starting where you're at is the way to go. And you know, the way it generally works is if an artist has work that sells well at a street fair, you know, community fair, then uh, you know, the galleries in that region are going to get more interested in that artist and possibly they'll get a representation in their community and then it kind of moves on i mean very probably almost no artists just start out at you know day one and get into a high level art fair it's just it's not the pecking order so we everybody has to kind of go where they are and take the opportunities that are in front of them you know but there's no trick to it it's just the work has to appeal to people and if it does a following develops and it kind of moves on like that so when tim and i select a few national shows to do the reason we take the huge economic leap to do these shows is because these were dealing with nationally known museum rich, you know, and people who are very much involved in the high level of the art world. So we're taking great pieces to a bigger audience. And generally, uh, when you, you know, like the big fairs, like the Armory Show in New York or the show in Chicago, uh, the artists that are shown there have a pretty strong exhibition history before they're actually shown. You guys do what, three fairs a year? Right now, yes. And you do Chicago, and you do what? one of the Armory shows in New York? The yeah. Armory show, Modern, and yeah, okay. the Metro show, which is in January. And the Metro show is a little more mixed. It's really a combination of contemporary art and folk art. So it's a more eclectic show. Gotcha. And Armory Show in New York, that's a very, very selective show. It's a difficult show for dealers to get into, actually. It's because it's international. There are dealers from all over the world, that, but it's invitational. So it's not like we choose. We have to be invited. Cool. Meredy, you have a question. Go ahead. Well, they're, they're actually uh, been a answering some of the questions. I was just wondering if if there's 
what feeds into the art fair in the periphery of, of the art fair? I mean, are there any other possibilities for people to say, show their work uh, that is somehow hooked into the art fair without spending thousands and thousands of dollars? You mean as dealers or artists? Uh, as artists, I mean, art, art, is there anything like, uh, for example, I think some time ago, the, one of the art fairs, uh, the art dealers fair in San Francisco, they, they had a, a, a kind of corollary going on where artists filled uh, hotels with work and created environments. And I don't know who was the mainstay. I mean, who was in charge of, the, of that project, but it seemed like a fantastic thing that, so that the same population could move uh, in, into more than one location. Well, almost all the major fairs now in different regions have satellite fairs and okay. events going on around them. Some of them are sponsored by local art organizations. Some are sponsored by other promoters that have created a satellite fair in a hotel, uh, a pop-up fair. I mean, all of these things uh, are, are happening uh, in, in a combination now of events. So if I want to go to Miami during the big week of art fairs, there might be as many as 18, 20 different events or, or more to be involved in, not to mention all the public things that are happening on the street and connection to foundations, museums. I mean, these have become very um, complex, layered uh, situations. So I think uh, for artists, yeah, within their region, I think there's all kinds of opportunities for I think art to be shown. I don't know a couple things here. A lot of these um, Meredith sh people who are putting on these shows that are appealing solely to artists are ripoffs. Some are good, some are not. You need to ask people who've participated before, or if they're new, you need to see what the organizers have done before, or you need to find out from people: Is this something? Are these people I want to go to bed with? Because it's like you know, you might get fucked, and. <laughs> For real, um, and, and and some of these entities are good, okay, and, and are run by good people, but not all of them are. And this is one of the places that people come to prey on artists, as well as other galleries. You know, it's the same thing. Um, and some of these shows are fabulous, but it's important that you check them out before you leap. Um, all right, um, Sarah, you have a question or comment. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, I was wondering if you ever do any comparative exhibitions where maybe you show some outsider work or older work, craft or folk art, and alongside contemporary artists like maybe John Walker, like who you have behind you, who I love, John Walker, by the way. Um, and to do kind of a compare, contrast kind of exhibition? Yeah, we've done quite a number of those. In fact, um, that is one of the main things that the gallery is all about, is trying to set up a situation that integrates, create a dialogue uh, for people to do exactly what you just described, compare, contrast, get involved with. Um, so we've done, we've done those numerous times. And, um, across all ages and all groups and all mediums, actually. Have you done any women's work specific? Have we? Yeah. No, no, I don't think we, you know, we've represented and still do quite a number of women artists, but it's not, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it just depends on the work and what, what we're thinking about, whether it's an ongoing representation, whether it's a group show, uh, so, the circumstances, I think, drive what we're, what we're do, you have, do you have catalogs for? Yeah, for certain shows, we, we do catalog. Um, recently, we just finished, a, we actually did two catalogs of one show for Alfred Leslie, uh, celebrating these works that he did in the late 50s and early 60s, multi-panel paintings that really hadn't been seen uh, in America. So. Um, it depends on the circumstances, but we do count. Yeah. 
And we have a website mm. that shows the contemporary art and the folk art, and it's a pretty broad-based site. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I was wondering more specifically about, I guess, curating around a specific, I guess, theme, and then kind of comparing it across the discipline, if that makes sense. I'm, yeah, that um, makes some sense. I don't sure. think we actually do that. I mean, we have had shows of categorical, you know, interests like quilts from all African American quilts and, you know, Amish quilts, quilts Amish. And we've done that, that kind of categorical. But in terms of contemporary art, we generally don't do uh, comparative, you know, people working in a similar, similar theme and you know, kind of a lateral comparative. We don't really do that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Does anybody else have a question? Ugh, I got the hiccups, excuse me. Um, Michael, forgive me from the hiccups. Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for speaking with us today. I uh, just had a question. I was just looking at your website uh, earlier. I was kind of curious about your uh, modern artists versus your folk artists. Uh, I thought that I like a lot of the artists you have, but I thought they were mostly brand brand name artists in a way. So I'm not sure if that is something you're uh, intentionally doing, but a lot of the names are, are sort of what I consider branded artists. They're really good, and they're historically recognized and commercially recognized. But I'm curious if you made a conscious decision to do that or if you uh just love the art and that's the way it worked out just a just a question yeah I, there was no conscious decision you know to do to change to select a brand or an artist's name that was particularly prominent it had to do with the work and some of these artists that are on the site you know we've been showing for 30 years ah. Okay. So maybe when we started showing them, okay. their recognition was not as high as it is now. Right. But, uh, you know, a person like Bill Rahauser, who we just recently started to show, um, wasn't known really outside this area at all. So, okay. um, yeah, I think we, it ends up kind of balancing in, in many ways. But uh, I, there are some very famous artists, you know, that we're involved with. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, you know, it just, it just started out, I mean, working like that. Part of it had to do with some of the dealers we were very close to in the beginning and worked with, uh, who also work with these artists. So. Did you know yeah. Dick Bellamy well? Very, very well, yeah. He stayed in this house many times. He's oh. a very close friend, yeah. I mean, I knew, I knew De Suvero okay, but, I, you know, in Bellamy, I only knew tangentially. Oh, really? Yeah, that's too bad. Uh, Dick was a, a very complex, uh, extraordinary individual who uh, was kind of an anti-dealer in a way. I mean, he was really all about the art and uh, very different than uh, the way people think about your description of, of art dealers. But many of the artists that he showed, we also worked with and met through Dick. Um, Alfred Leslie being one of them. And um, even the artists we're showing now, Tadaki Koyama, showed early with Dick even though we didn't connect with him in those years. Do um, you consider you. Bellamy a mentor? Absolutely. Yeah. He was important to yeah, us. He really much. was. He gave us a lot of opportunities. Dick uh, offered access for us, for a lot of people that we have handled, you know, for many, many years. Yeah, he's a very key person in our evolution. Are there other peer galleries like yourselves that he mentored? Well, yeah, yeah. I think he probably worked with quite a, quite a few people. But, uh, can you, who, who can we name? Um, maybe Barbara Flynn that he worked with very closely. I don't know her, okay. We worked together. And Barbara had a, a very uh, interesting gallery for a period of years in New York, showing exciting work. Um, I think there are others. I don't know that I pay that much attention you know, all the time to them. Um, but Dick was a very generous person. He was special. He was unique. 
Yeah, he was, uh, he was great. A total character. Yeah. Great eye. But there he are some others who are unique too. I mean, like Leo Castelli was uh, unique and a little bit similarly, and Xavier Forcade comes to mind. We, uh, we worked with all of these people, you know. Uh, Castelli was very generous with us. Uh, you know, I think what they what they realized is that we had a point of view, we had a, a location, we were uh, pretty driven and excited about what we were doing, and we were able to articulate that vision and serious. And we went out and found collectors, engaged with them, talked with them, and we were able to develop new collectors for the work. And it, you know they. They understood that process very well. Um, and this, you know, this is before the day of a lot of art fairs. Right. So there was only so much work that they could actually show in their galleries. Mm -hmm. And they were really looking for situations that would help celebrate what they were doing on the same level of intensity and passion that they were about. And so, you know, situations like ours were, were ideal. Nice. That's cool. Um, Becky, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I've been watch, looking through the website for the gallery, and I really like Bill Rawhauser's work. That's really interesting. Good for you. And it, reminds me, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Vivian Mayer's work, which... Exactly. Yeah, and, and, except she died and nobody saw the work until after she died. Um, what I'm curious about, I don't see anything on here that's obviously current, but you said he's still photographing. It, do yeah. you have examples of his current work that we can look at? Uh, we hope to soon. Um, there oh, is an Jesus. article that is going to come out uh, in actually Antiques Magazine, I think it's a November issue, that will show a number of very current uh, images Bill has taken. Um, three. He's, three, yeah. He's working with a model now, and he's doing some very purposeful, almost studio-like shots. But uh, he's very active. Uh, it's, it's great. I mean, his, uh, his, his vision, his eye, his energy is extraordinary. And uh, he's all over town, you know, giving talks. I mean, recently when he received the Kresge grant and they uh, celebrated the publication, of the eminent artist catalog, the monograph on Bill, you know, he, I think, gave three or four talks at the gallery um, to students and anybody that was really interested. So, uh, you know, in his life, how he got started, what he thinks about, what goes uh, through the process of actually taking a photograph, seeing it, all of it. Well, being a Michigander, I'm gonna try and see if I can figure out a way to ever see him in person, that would be great. Yeah. Send us, if you want to send us a, a request, we'll send you a, a catalog that was published by the Kresge Foundation. Because Thank you. So contact yeah. us, you know, through the website Website, or yeah. whatever, and uh, we'll send one up. So we do Thank have you. available to all, anyone here that's interested. Bill um, is very special. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, I don't see any more questions. I think we've covered them. I think you guys have shared a bunch of... <laughs> What's that? We put them to sleep, huh? Oh, uh, bravo. Um, put them to sleep. Um, all right. Does anybody have a question? Anybody want to unmute themselves who didn't, whose hand I didn't see or something? Are your audience that's listening to this, are most of you artists? They're all visual artists. All artists, yeah. All right. They're all over the place. Some are in Europe, some are in Australia, some are in Japan, some. That might just be, that might be a multiple of one, um, including one. And um, <laughs> Brazil and all the U.S. All right. Well, Pat and, and, and Tim, thank you both very much. I think this is great information. I appreciate, you know, 
I, I, we speak, we've spoken with a lot of good gallerists and galleries and from different parts of the world. And, you know, you hear different shades of the same thing. And you have, an, a, 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 I have, a growing awareness that it's about integrity. It's about of love of artists and, and wanting to enhance. It's a love of art and, and wanting to enhance artists' communication. And it's so much more about that than making money. And it's so much that artists and dealers are on the same team and on the same side and pursuing a common equation. And I think you guys are really good examples of that. I'm going to unmute everybody so that um, we can all say thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.